Engage in cartoon counter. Cereal. Check. Milk. Check. Cartoons. Check. We are ready for launch. Take off in five, four, three, two, one. Let's blast off for adventure with Jess Willie, internet critic, and his sidekick, Ralph. What is going on? Why do we look so funny? Because this is part one of the Saturday Morning Cartoon Chaos Spectacular Trilogy. And we're trying to replicate a Saturday morning of Jess's childhood as close as possible. So, cartoons consist of thousands of drawings, not stills with real mouths on them. Tell that to Camp Reproductions. Who? An ultra-low-budget animation studio that operated from 1957 to 1966. Most of their work was for TV commercials, but they dabbled in five-minute cartoons that could be syndicated for local TV stations' clown shows or packaged to 25-minute cartoons for Saturday mornings. I thought Nick said we were duplicating an early 80s Saturday morning of your childhood. We are. Cambria closed its doors in 1966, but nobody renewed the copyright on their stuff. These cartoons became public domain, so they aired around 4 a.m. on Saturday mornings until 1983. Uh, how would you know that? As a small child, Jess had an 8 p.m. bedtime. So on Saturdays, he was up by 4 a.m. Aha, uh -huh, I see. But that still doesn't explain the real mouths thing. The most time-consuming and expensive part of hand-drawn animation is syncing up mouth movement to dialogue. If your cartoon is a still of the character's face with the voice actor's mouth superimposed onto the drawing, you can save time and money. Sounds pretty lazy to me. And it is rather unpleasant to look at. Which is why their shows have wound up forgotten. That still doesn't explain why we're watching it! No time to explain. I was aiming to do 13 cartoons in just three episodes. To help adjust the timing, we could group the cartoons by theme. Today can be the warm-up act. You know, the stupid dish you watch until the real cartoons came on. That would mean we could do five cartoons today. Um, which episode of Space Angel are we doing? Scratch one, chimp. Ah, oh, f***. Oh, uh, Jess? Yeah? One more thing you gotta know before we start. The premise of the show is that there's a group of space troubleshooters. Their leader wears an eye patch only on missions. His code name is Space Angel. Sometimes he takes the eye patch off and is known as Scott McCloud. The understanding comics guy? No, don't be stupid. The bearded guy is codenamed Taurus. He was a Scottish engineer in space before a certain other 60s sci-fi show made it cool. The one who looks like your crush from high school, if she took off her glasses, is Crystal. Her job is, uh, to be the girl. Wait, don't go. I have so many questions. If they're secret agents, why are they visiting a school? Are they part-time dare officers? Uh, Nick? Nick? Hello? Shh. We're in the actual review. So Space Angel is at the school. He's teaching the kids about the history of space travel. He tells them about the time the space agency launched a pair of chimps into orbit around the sun. Wilbur the chimp came back. His twin brother Orville did not. Billy Batson starts whining, saying that they should go look for him. Space Angel says this was decades ago. He'd be dead by now. This makes Billy cry. The team is super happy when the chief calls and tells them about their new mission. Another round of solar research. They take off on their ship, start talking about the mission, and... We cut to after school. Billy's dad must have run off with the nanny and left Billy his old CB radio. He starts fiddling with it. He finds an old United Earth planetary frequency. 
He thinks the random background noise sounds like a heartbeat. And since it's coming from the sun, the source of the largest amount of electromagnetic activity in our solar system, his logical conclusion is, it's gotta be the chimp. We get another long ship sequence. What is this? Star Trek the motion picture? Scott and company are doing their jobs, and they get a call from Billy. You know, this is why students and teachers need to have boundaries when it comes to social media. Scott tells Billy to fuck off, but Billy plays the tapes. Scott, Taurus, and Crystal start to believe him. Either that, or they just want an excuse to go joyriding in their spaceship. Crystal is sitting at the communication station and says she gets the same signal. Billy says that's nothing. I've got a visual. And yup, it's an old-fashioned space capsule. Billy wants them to stop their multi-billion dollar real mission to go rescue Ortho. Taurus says this whole situation is impossible. You gotta change the laws of physics, Captain. Scott says, I don't know. I was watching Dr. Oz the other day, and he said we don't age in space. And that man has never gotten anything wrong about medical science before. I say we check it out. He calls his superiors on the matter. Being the chief on a procedural, genre rules declare he's got to behave like a complete asshole. He says, you've got a mission to perform, remember? Science needs that solar data for, um, science! Scott says, well, isn't a monkey alone in space in some sort of mysterious suspended state for all this time of value to science? The chief says, if it were a person... I'd say, yeah, but it's a fucking chimp, so shut up. Billy cries because Orville is going to die. His mom calls him down to dinner. He doesn't want to go, but they're having mac and cheese, so, you know, priorities. After dinner, Billy takes the moving sidewalk, or rather the sidewalk that moves the city when you step on it, to see the head of the space agency. Unfortunately, he goes through proper channels. So he gets into line A to get the paperwork he needs to get into line B, who mishear him and send him to line D instead of line C. So he waits in the secretary's office. She makes him go see Sigmund Freud for a few minutes before he's finally allowed to see the head of the department. Here is where it goes off the rails. The chief, who is a veteran of an intergalactic war that was mentioned in several previous episodes, looks into Billy's crying face and says, You're right. Starfleet is a promise. You give your life for me, I give my life for you, and no one gets left behind. So they call Scott, who is exhausted after a night of launching the probe, getting it up and running, collecting all that data, and say, yeah, since you're already up there, can you go save that chimp? We get another ship sequence. They blow the show's entire budget, turning the ship red with heat. It really looks like they're risking their lives for this chimp. Scott readies the cooling gun. Taurus goes out in his spacesuit and rescues Orville, and they make it back to the ship. Crystal calls Billy and tells him not to go to school today. The chief wants him on base at 700 hours. It isn't until they land that Scott realizes they have a serious problem. Orville has been out in space for 20 years. His original handlers have long since retired. Orville is out of stasis, but he's got nowhere to live. Billy says... My mom promised to get me a puppy, but I guess I'll have to settle for a chimp instead. Verdict on Space Angel? Do I have to? Yes. Oh. 
Oh my god, look at this. This show is complete. Well, I don't want to say ape shit, because I feel that's a bit too on the nose. Maybe I've been watching public domain material too long, but this show is a tough call. The science is shit. The animation is non-existent and or incredibly creepy looking. The voice acting is atrocious, but the story, well, I hate to say it, it's ahead of its time. You could take the same script, give it to a competent team that had an actual budget, and it might work. How do I know then? Well, one of the character and background designers for this show was Alex Toth, best known as the co-creator of Hanna-Barbera's Space Ghost. My DVD came from a box set of 120 episodes of television for $20. There were nine episodes of Space Angel included, so it cost about a buck fifty. If the box set came with 111 episodes of television for $18.50 but didn't include Space Angel, I wouldn't be disappointed. No! What's next? Well, another tradition of Saturday morning was the educational interstitial segment. These were no longer required after 1983, but most stations kept them going until 1996 when they were forced to give whole half-hour blacks over to educational shows. You actually managed to find some of these cartoons for sale? Yup, so let's get to the grandpappy of them all. Schoolhouse Rocks! The educational songs that ran on ABC from 1973 to 1984. You want to replicate a Saturday morning of my childhood? It's a must. If you say so. Okay, Schoolhouse Rocks was a series of shorts that attempted to be a more commercial Sesame Street for older kids. Each season they taught different stuff. Math, grammar, American history, and... During the final season of the original series, the new world of computer science. Yeah, exactly what four-year-old me wanted to see in between the double feature of Scooby-Doo. Alas, due to copyright issues and the fact that Schoolhouse Rock's current owner, Disney, is a pad litigious, I can't play any of the songs, so I better just... Get to the verdict. Yeah, I didn't learn anything from these songs, but they're catchy and brought back so many memories. They teach a lot of lessons that might be useful to a kid. Math, science, and a little bit of healthy distrust of the government. What? How else do you explain three-ring government? What is an elbow room a little bit? I don't know. Racist and imperialistic. Way to undersell it. But I paid four cents, so it's worth a watch. Yes! Okay, I hate to do this, but I gotta bring the pain. It's time for the adventures of Wacky and Packy. Wacky and Packy? Yup. Caveman and his pet, Wooly Mammoth. Wacky and Packy. Uh huh. Segment from Filmation's package show, Uncle Crocs Block. Wacky and Packy. Correct, Amundo. Wasn't Uncle Crocs Block so bad CBS decided to never work with Filmation again? Don't blame me. Blame Matt. The supposed friend I erased from history in a non-existent episode. Yeah, him. Look, I'll do Flintstone shit. That running gag is my fault, but I am not doing bootleg Flintstones. Not making you watch Wacky and Packy would be a violation of my prime directive to keep the show on track and to make your day suck. Aren't those the same thing? Prime directive. Fine. Fine. 
before our story begins, I already noticed a problem. Why is Wacky's hair blonde on the package, but he's a redhead on the show? It almost makes you think. No bootlegger, East-West Entertainment, the distributors of such fine animations as those released by Dinko Pictures, isn't on the up and up. Our story begins with a rhyme explaining how a prehistoric caveman and a woolly mammoth arrived in the modern era through a magic whirlpool. But they say they're from dinosaur days. They're only off by, oh, 64 million years. Wacky and Packy are hungry. They're looking for food. Remember what I said about humans and dinosaurs living about 64 million years apart? Well, apparently Wacky and Packy don't know this. They see a dinosaur eating dirt and think, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Oh yeah, and the dinosaur looks like this. Anyway, they go up to the dinosaur and ask for some yummy, delicious dirt. They're more than happy to oblige. They bury them faster than CBS did this show. They start eating. Packy loves it. Wacky, not so much. They ask the dinosaur for something else and get more of the same. So they dig their way out and try to beat up the dinosaur. It launches them into space. Wacky says, Packy, one of these days, bang, zoom, to the moon. Wait a minute, a caveman ripping off the honeymooners? Where have I heard that before? Packy responds with, uh, what I do? What I do? They land in a football field on top of the quarterback and pop the ball. Yet somehow the coach winds up recruiting them. Of course, he's going to have to make sure they know how to play, which is no easy task considering that Joe Kramath is really pissed at them for almost killing him. He looks at Packy and is all, He tasks me. He tasks me. And I shall have him. I'll chase him round the moons of Nibia. Round the Antares maelstrom. And round Perdition's flames before I give him up. Prepare to alter course. They skip ahead to the game without making sure that Wacky and Packy even know the rules before Howard Cassell introduces them. Kramer convinces them to get the ball and run toward their own goal line. Packy ends up crushing his own team. Kramer gives them even more tips. Bad ones. Wacky follows them, but Packy notices the crowd is booing. So he turns his nose into a vacuum and sucks Packy back, giving the team a touchdown. Freemuth quits. The coach says, why? Don't you want to be the star quarterback? Besides, what about your endorsement deals? After winning mostly by accident, Wacky and Packy are fired. Then we get another of those, one of these days, right to the moon, followed by Packy saying, Wha What did I do? What did I do? That's when I realized this incoherent mess is even less coherent than I thought. This wasn't one cartoon. It was two. While I'm not going to review every cartoon that was on this disc, I did watch them, and these two that I thought were one were the best of the bunch. Something is off about this DVD. 
It's not just that wacky looks different on the box. That's fine. Sorta. Or that it doesn't have a menu. Or the lack of closed captioning. This DVD didn't have closed captions. Nope. You mean you could have taken your hearing aids off, left it running, and taken a nap, and I wouldn't have been able to tell you weren't watching it. I would have done that, but it auto-plays, and I mean auto-plays. Once it gets to the end, it keeps going, and then, and then... Okay, cameras rise and shine, and don't forget your booties, because it's cold out there today. It's cold out there every day. I went into this expecting a bad bootleg of the Flintstones. What I got was a fucking awful bootleg of the Flintstones. This cartoon had animations, so it was better than Space Angel on a technical level. But Space Angel had original stories. If it had a budget, Space Angel could have been cool. Real money was put into Wacky and Packy. That's the best Filmation could do. That's what they thought quality animation was in 1975. That's one year after production wrapped on Star Trek the Animated Series, but it looks like a cartoon from ten years prior to that. This DVD changed my perspective on the universe. I still don't believe in God, who could after watching Wacky and Packy? But I think I believe in hell. It's not found after death. It's found in DVD compilations of cartoons released by East West Entertainment. Well, I'm not detecting any signs of PTSD, so it's edutainment time. And it's a series of shorts that's very near and dear to me. Paddington. Okay, what you've got here is an adaptation of the first chapter of the first of Michael Bond's Paddington books. The Browns are at the train station, picking their daughter Judy up from a trip. They come across this bear. He said he used to live in Peru with his Aunt Lucy, but he had to emigrate when she moved to a home for retired bears. But not to worry, he's friendly, and he'll be fine. He packed marmalade and everything. Mrs. Brown worries about where he's going to live. After all, she notices that famous, please look after this bear tag on his coat. The Browns go looking for Judy, or at least Mrs. Brown does. Mr. Brown goes to the cafe with Paddington. Since he's a bear, Paddington doesn't quite understand how restaurants work. He ends up sitting on his cake and getting all covered in frosting. Mrs. Brown finds Judy. They all hop in a cab and go home. The cab driver tries to charge them more for having a bear on board. And even more for a bear that's covered in cake, frosting, marmalade, and honey. And that's it. Well, that was quick. Yes! Well, I didn't watch all 56 episodes and specials, but I'm going to at some point. The animation style for Paddington is weird, but with purpose. The mixture of stop motion and paper cutouts creates a childlike sense of wonder. This incarnation of Paddington is absolutely delightful, and thanks to an amazing restoration job, the series looks more crisp and clear than it ever has. I got my set at Dollar Tree, but that's not all. It includes the 1997 Sinar Paddington cartoon, so at 50 cents, this series is a steal. Okay, do you guys know the worst part of it? 80s and 90s Saturday morning cartoons. 30 minute educational cartoons? Close, but no. Cartoons without a sense of conflict or purpose of story? Like Get Along Gang? Again, no. 
Uh, when animation companies add sci-fi elements and a catchy theme song to a existing, preferably public domain franchise to make it look like an action adventure show when it's really a covert educational cartoon? Ding, ding, ding! You win! A chance to watch our next cartoon, Deke's Biggest Flop of 1999, Sherlock Holmes and the 22nd Century. God damn it! The pilot must have had a budget because they bothered to do model sheets of three of the characters in different clothes so that our story can begin in 1891. You're familiar with the story of Sherlock Holmes and the final problem, right? Holmes goes on vacation. He's really there to investigate an arch nemesis we've never heard of before. Who he thinks is hanging out at Reichenbach Falls. An old man approaches Watson, saying a woman in the village needs doctor stuff. Once he's out of sight, he unmasks as Moriarty. He and Holmes fight. They both go over the falls and die. Yeah, the series adapts this. Then we cut to the 22nd century. London looks like the set of Blade Runner. Detective Elizabeth Lestrade is in pursuit of a suspect. He's a mad geneticist wanted for violating his parole because his personality readjustment didn't take. Her computerized assistant Watson is helping navigate the hover car without causing any accidents. But what do you expect from a piloting program that was 99 cents on the app store? This Fenwick guy gets out of his vehicle. He looks like a zombie. Lestrade naps him, but... His boss shows up and steals the downed car. And he's revealed to be... Bum bum bum! Professor James Moriarty. Back at the police station, the chief is pissed at her for all the destruction she caught. She tries to explain about the zombie guy, but he says, Yeah, but that doesn't mean a long, dead criminal mastermind is wandering around. He could have been using an image inducer. Like this. Then he makes himself look like B. Arthur and has the audacity to tell Lestrade that she's weird because she treats Watson like he's a person. She goes back to the mind control lab to make sure that Fenwick gets brainwashed properly this time. The tech blames his previous failure on a glitch, but Lestrade doesn't think so. She and Watson follow Fenwick to the Sherlock Holmes Museum, which is of course located at 221B Baker Street. The building looks pretty smashed up. They check to see what was stolen and find it's a piece of Moriarty's disguise? She asks why anyone would want to steal that and asks Watson for an analysis. But being a robot, he's very literal about it. That's what you get for not downloading the neuroimitating behavior upgrades. They're worth every penny. Back at the precinct, they see a new support on how neuro reprogramming could be losing its effectiveness. Lestrade thinks she knows what's going on and how to put a stop to it. She goes to see the chief who tells her to drop it. Whatever she's got to say is bullshit. She shows him all the tech stuff and... He's about to take her badge when they're called to another crime scene. When they get there, they run their tricorders over the evidence. Whoever stole the disguise is unknown, which should be impossible given how this future society is an Orwellian nightmare, and Lestrade's whole job is maintaining the status quo of this technocratic police state. Lestrade watches CNN and finds it's a typical news day. You know, Parliament has passed a law making putting dogs in costumes at fancy dress parties illegal. There have been more cases of police mind control not working, and some Nobel Prize winning geneticist has found a way of resurrecting dead tissue. So Lestrade goes to her family's self-storage unit to get the body of Sherlock Holmes. It turns out while Moriarty died, Holmes survived the fall. He became a beekeeper and preserved his body in honey. Then she decides to pay science guy a visit. 
he doesn't want to help her, but she threatens to tell the ethics board about his unholy work, which probably involves creating hybrids of Andy Dick and a muskox. What's so unholy about combining a muskox and another muskox? It takes Holmes a few minutes to wake up, but he's as good as ever. He figures out who she is and why he was resurrected right away. It's through a combination of family resemblance, her name being on her badge, and the only conceivable set of circumstances that anyone would do something so fucking insane. Lestrade and Holmes call the chief and try to find out what's been going on in the two hours they've been away. Holmes wants to be let in on the case. The chief says, no. Then they get reports that Moriarty is attacking and the chief says, better you than me, Mr. Holmes. The Watson droid wants to know what he should be doing during all this. Lestrade says they don't need him right now, so she gives him the collected diaries of John Watson to read during his newfound free time. Lestrade takes Holmes to meet the chief. The chief says he doesn't need the help of a dead guy. Lestrade says, well, I guess you don't need my help either. And since I'm not a cop anymore, I can go to the press. They'd love to hear how the police turned down the help of the one man who ever defeated James Moriarty. Lestrade and Holmes go talk to the brain tech guy. Holmes just watches a kid get mind controlled by the cops. But Holmes says, I've solved the whole thing. This guy isn't brainwashed. Follow him and he'll lead us to the solution. And of course, Holmes is right, and they pick him up all over again. Now Holmes wants to go back to Scotland Yard, but the computer system gets attacked. Lestrade says it must be Moriarty. Holmes says, nope. Oh yeah, and they switch to driving manual. As soon as they try... Someone hijacks the driverless controls. Most cops are dependent on self-driving cars in the future, so nobody knows how to drive. Oops. But that's not all. Holmes says this attack affects almost everything at the yard, apart from Watson. They get there and find Moriarty hacking into the system. A laser gun fight breaks out. Watson saves Lestrade. Holmes manages to fix the computer system by recovering a restore point from before the glitches started. But Moriarty gets away. Of course, the chief still insists the big bad is Fenwick. Holmes says, no, you're wrong. Lestrade says, so you agree it's Moriarty. Holmes says, no, our man wants to be Moriarty. He looks like Moriarty, he thinks like Moriarty. He might even think he is Moriarty. He may or may not be genetically identical to Moriarty, but he is not Moriarty. Of course, I'd argue if he's genetically identical to Moriarty, thinks like Moriarty, and thinks he is Moriarty, well, as sure as that boat that just pulled into the harbor is the ship of Theseus, that man is James Moriarty. Watson comes back, and since John Watson's diaries were written like one of those guys who overshares on Facebook, he has absorbed every last work of his namesake into his core programming. He's now no longer so literal. What I tell you? And the episode ends with the heroes knowing Moriarty might still be out there. And the game is afoot. Verdict. This cartoon as well, it's not horrible. It's probably the best show I've watched today. Even better than my beloved Paddington. There is potential for something cool, if it weren't for one small problem. Every episode is a retelling of a home story with sci-fi trappings. In this case, it draws from two stories. The final problem and the empty house. But Holmes is only drawn to cases that challenge him. If every case is a pastiche to a uh, mystery he's already solved, that's, well, is there a word for the opposite of a challenge? Yeah, 
It's called any Beach Boys concert since 1989. Still, if you don't overthink things, or this is your primer for getting into the Holmes mythos, it's kinda cool. At only a buck fifty, there are worse cartoons you could watch. Can you guess what our next episode is gonna be? Uh, we're getting to the good show. Yep, I do what I do. Four cartoons from the greatest animation studio of all time. Disney? Oh, yeah. DuckTales, Darkwing Duck, Goof Troop, and... Since you're a Jonathan Frakes fan, I'm guessing... Gargoyles? Uh, I meant to say second best animation studio of all time. Warner Brothers? Even better. Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, Batman the Animated Series, Superman, and Justice League. It's sort of Warner Brothers adjacent. You'll get to see Superman, Batman, and the Justice League. That would mean... Ah, uh, You were talking about Hanna-Barbera, weren't you? On the bright side, you get your yearly quota of Flintstones out of the way. You have a point there. I say we exit stage left, stage right, even. If you like this video, please hit like and subscribe. To see this channel grow and get your name on the credits, visit patreon.com slash films and become a patron today. Give us enough money and just might let you have a say in some of the movies we watch in the 2022-23 season.